A, I also swallow my gum and I don't understand why it's unusual. People think that I am a loon. I've gotten texts from people I haven't heard from in ages because I said that I swallow gum. Both of you swallow gum. Uh, you two cannot control whether or not, if you chew gum, you're going to swallow it's it. It's not about control. That's a, it's a weird idea. It, it, it's simply that it can be swallowed. And in my experience, most of the problematic stuff that happens with gum happens with people who do not swallow their gum. Littering, having it stepped on. Thank you. All of those things, that is exactly why. Plus, also, it does you no harm. I, I mean, I don't know how much gum others chew. I do not chew gum all the time. I try not to look like a cow chewing the cud. But <clears throat> on the occasion that I do <laughs> chew gum, I just swallow it because it's more expedient. And it does no harm. It's and like it the does, and it does no harm. That is the key. It sentence. does no harm. It's digested almost completely. It's almost entirely not your problem, right? It, it, it's everyone like everyone who... seems to think it's their problem yeah. that I swallow gum, and it's like, no, this is how I dispose of it. It doesn't affect you in any way. Why am I the weird one? This is like the people who don't eat the seeds of fruit. Some kind of vestigial, stupid idea. Oh, it'll grow something in your stomach, or it's just come on, people, stop it. You have sided with the wrong person. <laughs> Everyone rains down judgment on him as being truly strange. Uh, and he is forever offering to the audience all of those wonders so that we can dissect them. But And every once in a while, you never know where people are going to connect. <clears throat> every once in a while, a John Amici comes to his side and makes him feel less alone and slightly less strange, but only slightly. <laughs> we welcome in John Amici from... Uh, over the ocean because as an emergency, and it took us a few days to get to it, we had to fly him in as our UK correspondent to <laughs> talk about how it is all of England is burning and shocked, shocked that a 96-year-old woman would die of natural causes. The Queen, I never understood any of that, any of it. Please explain to me everything that's happening there because <laughs> I've never understood... America's fascination with it. I don't understand falling in love with the tapestries and the ornate nonsense of royalty. Yes, it is confusing. I, I think to start with the Americans' fascination with it, that's very confusing. It's almost like we've ended up with, you know, Hamilton, the play, and, and the person people enjoy seeing most is King George. And not because he's ridiculous, but just because he's, he's royal, apparently. First thing, I'm trying to do um, compassion gymnastics here. Because some of us know what it is to lose our mother. And, and it, it, is a, it is a, it's like a never, it's a wound that never goes away. And so for the family, um, I sat on a, on a board, on a charity board with one of her sons. And for those people, I have reached out and given and sent my condolences because I think that's real. But this um, grief Olympics that's going on, uh, just as I was waiting downstairs, somebody, somebody's put a tattoo of the queen on their thigh as a mark of respect, and I don't understand how it is a mark of respect. It, it's like it's a competition for people to show how pious and full of grace they are in order to show how grieved they are. <clears throat> and I know that there's many people queuing up in eight or 40 now queues right now to watch her in state. And I can't speak to the mindset of all of these people. <clears throat> but I don't understand it because I've met, I had met the Queen five or six times. And she was pleasant and well informed and instructed and cordial. But we didn't build a relationship in that time. And I've had more of an opportunity to do that than most people. It's like people are mourning the idea of something rather than someone in particular. And that's strange to me. I'm not sure I'm a burn down the monarchy person, though I, I could happily do without them. They're, they are a tremendous tourist attraction. But to me, this is, this is a strange time where, because I have an OBE, people will be quick to point out, and order um, a, a kind of officer of the Order of the British Empire, and people think it's, you know, despite the name, they think it, that I got this for my participation in, in atrocities on behalf of the British Empire. It's simply an acknowledgement. It's our way of acknowledging people, just like the Presidential Medal in this country. 
and I know other people who haven't taken it because of the colonial aspects of our country. But I don't think you have to go that far. I just don't understand how people build a connection with strangers just because they happen to be ever present. And that's probably the biggest part of why she's so popular. She has been the background of everybody's lives. Most of the people have never had a different monarch. It's a strange one for me because I, I, I understand the pain that the families are going through. I don't understand the pain that strangers are going through. When you say love with the idea of something, the idea of what? The idea of a, of a time when Britain was more well-respected, when we were steeped in kind of, we were the top of the pile, where everything about us as a country was leading the narrative everywhere in the world, where we still had people as property, where we still had countries, other countries as property, now called the Commonwealth, the 57, if it is 57 still left, countries that we <clears throat> invaded and, and then became part of this Commonwealth. And people lament the fact that that, that seems to be dissipating in front of their eyes. They, they lament the fact that people are toppling statues of some of the people who epitomized that era. And yet the Queen was such a likable version of that era far more likable than some of the other characters that we might mention, political and historical. And now she's gone, I think people are worried that it's the beginning of the end, and not just for the monarchy, but for that type of Britain. There are a lot of things that feel like they're beginning of the end in your country. Energy bills going up 80%, inflation crazed. What are the things that you're looking at and it feels a little bit like walls are closing in on you. Well, I'm, everybody's really worried about the cost of living uh, crisis in Britain. It, it's marked that that across Europe, the you know some of the countries most affected by the the Russian uh, activities, the Russian, the war against uh, Ukraine, their gas prices have gone up by eighteen percent, twenty percent. Ours have gone up by eighty, and now multiples of that. It's hard to understand. I mean, this is what happens when you separate yourself from a big block, a trading block. You end up on your own and isolated and without the buying power and all those other things. It's not just a Brexit issue, but that's a big part of it. Uh, I suppose my, my, that's coupled with uh, an extreme lack of compassion for people without. A, a woman, <clears throat> she's a former politician. She came on television, national television, talking about the cost of living crisis where real 96-year-olds in our country are going to freeze to death over the course of our winter. That is how they will die. Not surrounded by their family, alone in their home, in care homes perhaps, and they will freeze to death because of the cost of living crisis. And the advice that this former politician gave was to bring with her a roll of tinfoil. Is that what you call it, tinfoil? Yeah, a roll of tinfoil and instructed the country that what we need to do is put that behind our radiator because that'll solve the problem. It's just, it's, it's why this, this period is so hard for me. We've, we've got 10 days of enforced mourning where in, in Britain right now, you know you, we can't play fast songs on the radio for 10 days because of compassion for this woman who was dutiful and all those other things, but a stranger to most. And on the other hand, here's a woman, a politician, telling people who are in real peril that they should put some aluminum foil behind their radiator so that they don't freeze to death. Well, let's talk about the state of leadership throughout the world. You and I were talking the other day, and you were uh, ambitious and inspiring in saying... I want my political leaders to be better than me, to be smarter than me, to be not a, not a reflection of me, to be people who lead because I want to follow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all of that. <clears throat> I want leaders to stop me in my tracks when I start saying that the, the answer is simple. You know those, those complete idiots out there who say, you know, if, if I can balance my checkbook, why can't the, the government balance their budget? I want a leader who just says, stop, so 
got one moment. And let me ex let me explain how incredibly stupid that analogy is, how sophisticated these systems are, and all the levers that we have to pull to make this work. I want somebody who who helps to stop me from having stupid, unwell regarded thoughts and helps me see how the world is this nuanced and sophisticated place that doesn't have simple levers to, to, to make things better. I want leaders who understand the major scientific concepts that are going to drive our success or death over time. I don't want people who think that, like Senator Inhofe, that you can bring a snowball onto the floor of the house and that is somehow a refutation of climate change. I don't want that. And I don't understand why everybody doesn't want that. I, I've met a couple of presidents, uh, notably President Obama for me, and I was a bumbling idiot in his presence. And he didn't even try to make me feel like a bumbling idiot. I want super smart people, and there are other super smart people. There are smart Republicans. There are smart conservatives. <clears throat> but they seem to know that utilizing that smarts is not politically expedient for them. I want more of that. I don't want to have a beer with them. I've got pee bag. Have a beer with you. I want, I, I, want, I want people who dazzle me with their intellect and with their ethics. That's who I want in charge. And so what do you make of the state of leadership all around the world where it, it, it really does seem like a parade of the worst of us? There is, um, I don't know who said it, but there's a, there's a quote that, you know, the people who want to be leaders in politics are the very people who should never be leaders in politics. It does appear that there is a tinge of truth to that. I, I don't, I hope it's not universally true. I, I mean, it's poor, right? It's just poor. Poor leadership everywhere. It's the leadership that thrives to self-perpetuate that's so dangerous, I think. Those people who lead in such a way that they can maintain their position, as opposed to maybe I only get, maybe I only get um, one term in office. By but I, I put in these things that are really going to make a difference for people, and maybe long after I've been in office, it'll make a difference. But it will make a difference. We need more people like that, surely. People who want to lead not for the power of it, not because it's a steady job but because they know that there are people, constituents in their community, those who often don't have the means to donate to them, who need their, who need their advocacy. Witty, you weren't in the room when it happened, but he said he had met many presidents, including President Obama. And I struggle a little bit uh, because uh, Amici's energy level, while re really thoughtful and always something that we like to have around, the audience wants jazz hands, and so I'm a little worried that uh, we're not engaged, we're not playing, okay. <clears throat> playing around with him enough, okay. fooling around because I've gone dry and serious. NPR, BBC, and oh, I no. need, uh, yeah. Well, I, he doesn't always want to be serious philosopher sitting on a rock guy uh, talking to you about what ail. Uh, the globe. Can I tell you, I'm quite pleased that I got that jingle, though, because I heard about it yesterday for the first time. And 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 yes, I'm congratulations here for it. on I'm here for uh, it. congratulations. It's not a jingle, but it's just a sheer mockery What's, of what, you. What would you call it? I just can't believe that when you first you went to OBE, first you volunteered that, and you somehow got out from under the guillotine of "Look at me, Louis." As while you were saying, by the way, that other people are quick to mention it when you were the one who was quick other to people, mention it. But in the context, so it, it is important, right? Because in the context of um, being a black British person, there are lots of black British people who've refused to take their honor. And I haven't. And I remember the day that I got the letter about it, because they send you a letter now, so that they can't be embarrassed by you refusing on the day after it's announced. So they sent me a letter, and I remember sitting down with my sister around her dining room table in, in Stockport and saying, can I take this? What are the pros and cons? Will I be absolutely nailed by a a percentage of the black community and, and impoverished communities and communities in Commonwealth countries who feel still quite aggrieved by what's gone on in the British Empire. Because the word empire in there, I'm, I'm also part of a campaign trying to change the name to the Order of British Excellence, because that's what it should be about. When it's given as an MBE, member of the British Empire, it's given to somebody who's, who's done tremendous work in the community, tremendous work internationally perhaps, 
but it is still really contentious. I get, uh, you know, something online almost every week from somebody who says, how can you talk about equality while still being an OB? There are so many, so many conflicts, though, everywhere. John, you have said, uh, famously quoted, you can't be a part-time man of principle. Mm -hmm. But all of these decisions that anyone has to make from the car they're driving to to decisions like this where you can't just be honored because you have to make sure that you're not falling on the wrong side of something – would you take it today? Would you take the same honor today, given the state of of your country? Or what would push you to not accept the honor as it exists, as an empire, not as an excellence? Everything that's already happened that would tell me to not take it has already happened. You know, if if, it, if I was upgraded next week to a knighthood, there's real influence that comes with it. I know it's hard to imagine from an American perspective because it's really stupid, right? But there is real influence that comes with it, that my ability to get into and to talk to people who would not ordinarily want to, and I don't mean just commercially, like in service of my organization, my company. I mean in service of trying to make change. The number of um, government white papers I've been able to be involved with on duty of care, on um, a number of them on sports and how we improve the, 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 to make sure that kids are not abused in sport and taken care of. Things that I could never get into, and it's like everybody on there's got that honor. It, it it opens doors for me to do more more things, and I already feel like I'm at the limits of my power. I already feel like I don't have enough kind of cachet and weight to really get to the places I need to. So I, I don't know. I probably I don't know. Probably take it. To explain to people what influence means and how you have used it throughout uh, your life. You recently in Charlotte met three young professionals, all of whom moved you. At this point, those are the things that give you the greatest blessings yeah. moving through the world, yeah, right? It, it's super cool. It, it, there is something remarkable about being able to build a connection with people reasonably quickly in such a way that they understand that if they were to tell you things that they might have been afraid to share with others, you would be there, you would, you would like really focus in and you would want to respond in a way with a solution and it's not just me who does that lots of people do that well <clears throat> and so we i had a day with this this organization that i've been working with a lot in in charlotte and then in the evening we went to this you know like the the reward for three days of being in a conference is the party at the end and i being me found a table six feet from the front door of the place plonked myself down with a drink and it's just a this is like a reception line, actually. A series of people kept on coming up to me, and the things that they talked about, despite blaring music in the background and weird performances and stuff, were super profound. And there's, uh, there was three of them. There's a, a, a young man who was, who was struggling with how to talk about himself to his boss, and there was another young man who was... Uh, a minority in the context, ethnic minority in the context of his business, nobody else around him like him, and was full of uncertainty, despite being so evidently brilliant. I hate saying that. People who are so evidently brilliant, but just don't know it. So we had a conversation about, he is how, this is what I see in you, and it was great. Uh, another woman who was, who was trying to understand how she leads in a way that's authentic to her but still recognizable as leadership because people always get told there's a certain way of doing it and i even as i sat there i was like that that's a that's a bloody brilliant party i've just been to and there were more people but it's just those three stuck in my head the next morning i woke up smiling about that because it's like that's that's pretty cool well that's where you find hope these days right because it's hard to find it yes yeah is it hard to find it I think I make it hard to find. In sometimes. people? In people? It's not hard to find. So I, it's hard to find in the people of authority who are currently occupying seats of power. It is not hard to find other places. Even as I walked over here, I walked past, I don't know what the name of the hotel or, or bar is, but it's the, the one that has the drag queens out front. And they, they were doing their performance. And it was amazing because... They, they took a break from their performance to say, right, so we're just going to take a quick break to talk about the leadership of Florida. And I want you to all join in me as we say an, a not very nice word about Governor DeSantis. And it's like, even there, on a random street in Miami, and they had this huge audience chanting this, they're making a difference. 
you may not agree with the politics of it, but they're making a difference. Can you explain uh, to the audience, as you see all of the divisions in politics and elsewhere, uh, what you make of how divided we are? <clears throat> Nobody's going to listen to this episode, are they? <laughs> um, are you afraid <clears throat> of getting in trouble? Or no, is it no, no, it's no. it's too no. dry or too no, no, serious? Too, just think, yeah, it's, too, too, too depressing, too sociological? All of those things. All of those things. So I hate this this conversation about we're divided, right? I think it's not very nuanced and not real when you look around. So there's often a divide. So I think people are allowed to have opinions. I think d opinions are great things to debate. Sport radio is in part about that, right? I like the Marlins. You like the, I'm now at the end of the ne the teams that I know. <laughs> not even the Yankees, huh? Uh, Yankees. Uh, are they in the same thing? Yes, they are. Oh, that's bad because I thought Marlins were football. Then. <laughs> ah, there we go. Okay, good, good. I'm on. No, this is. I'm on a roll now. This is good. This is good. Uh, but you can have those debates about, you know, who you think is better and why you think this person plays so well. And I think those are great things. Why I like avocado. Why you don't like. These are great things to have debates about. But facts are different. And I know people will say alternative facts and they have their own facts, but there are some things that we know. The earth is not flat. There is not a ring of ice around a disc. Quite literally, none of the laws of physics can operate while that is true. Large masses in space accrete into spheres, always. The earth is not 6,000 years old. I do not need to denigrate someone's religious beliefs. But that is an objectively true thing because, again, your phone and those computers and nothing that we're doing works if the earth is 6,000 years old. These things are not to be debated. And then when it comes to human being, the idea that we trivialize human beings and have debates about the validity of the existence of certain types of human beings, whether they be immigrants or anybody else. The idea that we commoditize human beings in such a way that when they arrive in the country, we make policies to move them either to other parts of the country, as is happening in Florida now, or, and if you think you're bad, by the way, in the United Kingdom, our government has just tried to enact a rule that when immigrants come to us across the channel, and arrive, they are shipped to a, a random African country. Think of the compassion of that, knowing the number of people who die in those boats. Their, their claim is that it will put people off, but when your life and your world is turned upside down in the country that you live in, when you think that your child could be arrested by a religious zealot and forced never into marriage or, or, or never to, to get an education. The hardships of that crossing of the channel is nothing. They will still come. And when they come, you send them to a country that the British government has already said in Rwanda, they have doubts, doubts about the human rights record of them. This, we're not divided. How is everybody not universally horrified by the idea that when somebody comes who is desperate, we put them on a bus and send them to Martha's Vineyard. Not a bus, a plane, and then video it because you're that eager to make it political propaganda. It's not just it's spending awful. $12 million reportedly of taxpayer money. You're also videotaping it so that you so can get props. So sending others elsewhere becomes a show of strength. Human suffering as a prop. Perhaps that what the... Perhaps that's what's that um, that ten hour queue to watch the Queen in state is about. Human suffering as a prop. What are we to do with our leaders doing things like that, though? Because it's not if not more divided than I can recall being overt in my lifetime, 
then what? Because we're not universally horrified by it enough to make sure that that's not in leadership or to make sure that that's not okay or to make sure that that wouldn't be something that he's doing purposefully because he thinks it'll be successful. There must be a division there if he's doing that as a prop and thinks it's going to work. There is um, cognitive dissonance going on. People who want to consider themselves good people and imagine that what good people would do is support a governor who is a human trafficker. Um, they imagine that when um, when people complain about, I don't know, the LGBTQ community or the black community or some other group of people and and assign them a set of terrible things that they all do because they're all part of that group, they've fooled themselves into thinking that good people would want to stop that. When somebody pulls up a random bullshit fact, a bullshit kind of, what's it called, uh, uh, opinion about, by, like, oh, the problem with black people is it's all fatherlessness, even though the data tells us that's not true. Uh, these people fool themselves into thinking, you know, that explanation is, is, a, is a better explanation for the circumstance of many black communities than the litany of historical and current ongoing policies, procedures, laws, interactions with people in positions of authority that have created this systemic challenge. It's cognitive dissonance. Sometimes you just get to have to really uncomfortable with the fact that you're part of a system that does crappy things to, to, to people who haven't asked for it and don't deserve it. You've talked a lot over the years. It's probably been a conversation that I've heard in sports for 40 years, going back to Barkley. I am not a role model. You you believe that athletes are and should be. I certainly believe they should be. I don't have to believe that they are because, you know, even on a purely commercial level, um, Federer, who just retired, see, look at me with sports knowledge, by the way, Congratulations! Thank you. Thank uh, you for that. You wanted you. Were you calling for a look at me I was. there? You were I was. calling, I was. but I don't. I don't think that deserves. It's not a, a look, look at me. me. There. There's <laughs> some fanfare, but you do not get a look at me. I, I want. I for, wanted. I wanted fanfare for because no, for knowing I, that I know sports now, um, except for the sports team. Um, but he. You thought uh, the Marlins were a football team? I did think they were a football team. <laughs> I was in Charlotte the other day and I saw a, a cat outside a stadium, and I was like. The Charlotte Jaguars? That doesn't sound right. Is it the Charlotte? What, who are they? No, they are the Panthers. Oh, there you go. Well, I can't tell. It's made of metal. I can't tell it's black. <laughs> anyway, where was I? I forgot what I was saying now. Role models. <laughs> that, that, they, uh, that they should be role models, but you don't have to agree. Yeah, you with... don't have to agree that they are. I don't have to believe that they are role models, simply because from a commercial point of view, Federer would not have got $1 billion, reportedly, in advertising revenue, brand revenue, over the course of his career, if it wasn't for the fact that people looked at him and to a very granular level decided, not only will I follow what this person do does, I will wear what he wears. I will smell the way he smells with his perfumes. I will wear the jewelry that he endorses, his watches and stuff. We know that this is, you know, the beautiful thing about being a role model, I think, is the idea that you don't pick it. It's not a title you can claim. It's like those assholes who call themselves thought leaders. You can't claim to be a thought leader. Other people tell you you are. You can't claim to be a role model. Other people tell you you are. And even if they don't tell you, you have to assume that even for the worst athlete, like you know, someone like me, super average, there's a kid somewhere who's watching. Even if what they're thinking is, holy smokes, if that guy can make it, then I can make it. I love your description of yourself as an athlete that's super average. <laughs> Super average, a dismissal of a how uh, how long was your career? Seven professional years? Six. Six professional years. Is that longer than most? Is that about super average? I don't know what the average in basketball is. In football, less than three. In, uh, is it in basketball? In yeah. football, it's about uh, three years. Yeah. It's less than three. You know, you know that because you only get your pension after three. <laughs> what do you think, bouncing around here with you, of people's where they're working from these days, office mandates, uh, change. Malcolm Gladwell got excoriated pretty good by saying, what's the matter with you? Get into an office. 
uh, espousing what uh, a lot of people dismissed as an old person's opinion. It's, it's, it's not fair to call it an old. I'm an old person. It's not fair to call it an old person's opinion. It's just just. Oh God, I I use the word stupid. I need, and I have, like much like Trump, I have many good words. I just can't, I, can't, I need something else. But it's so obtuse. Why am I in the office? Why am I here? If I'm here doing all the same things that I can do in front of my screen at home while wearing my PJ bottoms, while being able to go to the kitchen and get myself actual good tea, while being able to go on my bathroom breaks without my entire office knowing that I'm doing that. If that's what's happening, I'm just doing the same things so that you can watch me. That's weird. It's like a human zoo. Come into the office, not so I can interact with you in any way that is different or enhanced, but so I can observe that you are actually doing something. I need to see you being industrious to validate. That is a, if I didn't trust my people to work when I wasn't watching, I've hired the wrong people. When they come in the office, I want people to know that there is a purpose for this. It, and part of that purpose is the, is the purposeful paying for people to socialize. I want my team to talk to each other. I want them to interact. I want them to laugh together. I want them to dig into chewy, difficult problems together. That's what I want the office to be about. We've got two offices. We only have 20 people in our company. We have two offices in, in different parts of the country because we want people to be able to come together. And people are in one and a half days a week on average. And they tend to choose the same days so they can socialize and, and connect and chew through the difficult challenges that we face. It's, it's a real estate problem that we're trying to deal with by pretending it's a good idea. Do we you know that productivity, happiness, all went down when we went to open plan offices. And people were suggesting that was about collaboration. And that went down when we went to open plan offices. We went to open plan offices because you can get more desks in a smaller space. That's why we did it. It was a commercial decision. And then we tried to pretend that it was about people. The same thing is happening here. Get back in the office. It's about collaboration. Yeah, because that's what we did in the before times. Some boss pontificating in front of a whiteboard while everybody else has to nod like sheep. Not. I feel strongly about this. Well, you're a corporate coach, and you are hired, and people pay you a great deal of money to help them lead better. I don't know how much better you've gotten at this since you've started. You find it very rewarding. What are some of the things that you have learned about what corporations do most wrong and most right? Um, probably demonstrated very well in the last three or four years. What corporations do poorly very often is they promise at this high level and very very explicitly they make these huge promises at a very high level and then fail to deliver systematically i mean or rather more appropriately systematically fail to deliver sometimes have they no no intention because they believe that the rhetoric alone is going to be this kind of motivational power that will sustain so you know during the black lives matter movement um, you had organizations that we're going to be an anti-racist organization. That's a big claim to make. Not to be not racist, to be anti-racist. Big claim. And it's now, what, 840 plus days since George Floyd was murdered, and people haven't managed to achieve that. In 840 days, do you know you can learn two languages in 840 days? You can learn two languages based on two hours a week in 840 days. And yet in 840 days, and even more than that, we haven't managed to help men to realize that massaging the shoulders of this random woman is not an appropriate thing to do. We haven't managed to convince people that forcing people back into the office because you don't trust them is not the thing to do. It's just amazing. This promise versus, versus actual is this big gap. And the other big thing is something we talk about all the time, my, my team and I, is this idea that almost every problem you see at a corporate level, and in some regards political level, can be explained by the dynamic of the tension between personal comfort for leaders, people with authority and power seeking personal comfort or at least the avoidance of discomfort, juxtaposed against organizational performance, 
almost everything you see can be explained by, I am doing this to be more comfortable or at least less uncomfortable, despite the fact that that will harm the organizational performance. Not the organizational feeling, not if it feels nice, but the actual performance. Almost everything we see can be explained that way. Can you elaborate on that? I'm trying to understand what you're saying as someone who's trying to run a company. Yeah. So um, uh, many companies, let's, let's do it in a really Teutonic way. It's not, not about some big issue, but about, say, you guys are all thinking about how you're going to install a new piece of HR software because at some, size, some point you'll get to big enough that you need to have a system that helps you understand, that helps you manage people. So... Loads of organizations are doing that. We had a client who was trying to put in a piece of software that was descriptive analytics. It was just a tool to help them um, graphically picture stuff to show clients, because clients like to see pictures and graphs. I almost went into a, uh, another aside about that. It's really good data that when you explain something to somebody, even really well, you get about a 60% acknowledgement of, of what you've done. If you explain and put a graph that says the exact same thing, you get about 90% acknowledgement. It's really, really good. Anyway, so they're putting this system in, and it failed. And it failed again, and it failed again. And actually, when it came to three years later, they still hadn't implemented it fully, and they wanted to implement a new piece of software because of the way the world works at pace. There was a better piece. And we came in to help them with that process. And it, when we found what we found out, they thought it was some complex thing about systems and processes. It wasn't. Partners just said, I don't like this. It doesn't feel good to use this. And so I won't do it, despite the fact that all the data told them that when they used it with clients, they sold more. Personal comfort, or at least the avoidance of personal comfort, or discomfort versus organizational performance. You made a distinction I've seen you make before, but for the audience that hasn't, you punctuated the phrase anti-racist. The, distinct, the distinction you're making on how people need to behave around racism that uses the phrase anti-racist, what is the distinction you're making there? So that everybody doesn't tune out. This is true for all incivilities, right? So it's by anti-misogynist, anti-homophobic and transphobic, anti, um, anti, anti-immigration. It's it's a it's against the opposite. So the way I do it is the is is the analogy of the fence, right? You think of sitting on the fence. That phrase, being not racist, is sitting on the fence. Not misogynist is sitting on the fence. It means that when somebody does something that is misogynist, if it's small enough in your mind, and it's amazing how big things can escalate to, and you can still rationalize that it's small, you do nothing because you don't want to get involved because you're not involved because it's beneath you, quite literally, and you would never do it, you rationalize in your head, and you're going to stay away from it because that's what a responsible person does in your head. I am not that. If there is an incivility in this world and there is a fence, I am not on it. I'm on the other side of that, staking my position as opposed to this. But I'm not on the other side hoping that you or Chris or somebody else will solve racism or whatever the incivility is. I am constructing something that will destroy racism with fire. Same for ableism, same for uh, misogyny. You name the incivility and I'm coming for it with fire. That's what being anti-racist, anti-misogynist is about. The idea that you equip yourself, arm yourself to eradicate this evil. That's, that's, where, that's where we need to be. It isn't an opinion to think that all black people are criminal or stupid. It isn't an opinion to think that women should be subjugated and quiet and demure and service men at every second. It isn't an opinion. It's an evil. Got to hear both sides. No, both sides is bollocks. The BBC is currently imploding because of that. The BBC is imploding on itself. It is losing credibility as a public service broadcaster because it has this doctrine introduced very strongly by the current government over the last 12 years of impartiality. So when somebody comes on, when they bring a lauded international climate scientist onto the onto BBC, they have to either raise themselves or bring another guest on who says the opposite. That is not impartiality. It is madness. If you get an astrophysicist on who talks about the Earth and planets and how they're constructed, you have to 
say, at least say, there are obviously people out there who don't believe this is how it works. And you bring somebody on who says, I found this fossil and it's X number of million years old. And you have to bring somebody on and say, well, of course, not everybody believes that. But that's bollocks. That's not impartiality. Impartiality is about a robust um, interrogation of the facts and the evidence. And then a robust defense of that conclusion until new evidence, which is well-sourced and independent, comes to, to make you change your ideas. Uh, this happens all the time in science. And that's why people, people think, I think because of politics, we think changing your mind is a bad idea. But this happens all the time. I remember when I first learned about emotional literacy. There's a, Daniel Goleman is the, is the kind of guru of that back in the day. And I loved his stuff. And I was certain that his stuff was the ultimate answer. That was it. And then all of a sudden, a few years later, a group of people came up with what they call the four-branch method, which was a, a better understanding of emotional literacy and a better way to explain it to the world. And then after that, somebody else came up with a new methodology. And you just I remember the, the, the pain that I felt. I felt actually quite aggrieved when I realized I had to let this go. And I had to endorse this new thing because there's new evidence and it better explains the world. Why are, we, why are we juxtaposing things that better explain the world against things that simplify, muddy, and otherwise treat us as clowns? You actually struggled with uh, getting attached to a, a thought and new information. I, I think of you as someone who's perpetually learning, not stubborn about knowing what he knows. No, uh, perpetually curious, that's for sure. But sometimes you, you come across something. I'm sure everybody's had this even, even in another context. You just come across something that just feels right, like this is the way. This is always going to be the way. And Goldman just explained things in a way that to, to me was so colorful and I could use it in stories and I felt like it helped people. And then I, I remember I was actually sat um, at UCLan, the University of Lancaster, which is a university with a bunch of other psychologists. And I was talking about Goldman and they were saying, I remember, I remember being sat in this room and they talked about the four branch method, and they said I should I should really look into it. Really wonderful, kind way of doing it. Not you idiot who's not, you know, upfront with all the new things that are happening. They said you should really look into this. And even in that moment, I was like, there's something that you're saying is better. These six eminent psychologists. I went away. I looked at it, and I just sat there like, oh my god, how long have I been spouting the old stuff when there's new stuff? And I was like, but I really liked it. And you just have to let these things go. But it makes sense, though. I do believe that a lot of what is happening in all the countries right now is a refusal to budge from what has always been your position, yeah. no matter the new information, a rejection of new information. It, it is hard, isn't it? Because we do like to take information and, and make it about us, make it integrate it into part of our person. And so... When we move on, when new information comes in, new evidence that changes that, it's like we have to actually change ourselves. And that can be hard. You know, I, many people listening to this will struggle with the pronouns thing. And I, I like to consider myself properly woke. I think that's an appropriate thing to be. Um, especially given woke just means interested in social justice, right? Or awake. Or awake, which is also good. Uh, and it's not a new term, by the way. I had a, I gave a whole speech on this the other day, but it's not a new term. No, um, please take us down the path. No, Go no, ahead. no. Take us down the path of whatever the items in that on a prepared Amici speech were uh, on on you got motivated to attack just the word that's it, been weaponized. It woke, was woke, and cancel culture were two terms that were being used in this organization. They said, "Can you help us with?" Because we're really struggling with this. And I want to. I like, want to hear your thoughts on this. It's Forgive me. Not new. It first appeared in the New York Times. Uh, I, I don't know the, the date will escape me, but it was in the 50s. And it was um, an essay that was written in the New York Times. And it, even before that, there were beat poets who were using it in Harlem. Um, so it's been around for a long time. It's not new. So people's critique of it as a new thing that's you know politically correct is incorrect factually. So, but the, the reason... I've, I've forgotten what I was... What properly I was. woke. You were saying you consider I, I yourself properly, properly woke. woke. But the, the, the pronouns thing. Somebody came to me with some pronouns, 
And I was like, what is it? I was irritated. I think it was Xi Zhe, and I was irritated because I don't know what that means. It was a younger person, and I couldn't tell if they were just trying to piss me off. And I'm, you know, woke. But then I suddenly realized I just have a choice. Do I want to build a relationship with this person, even fleeting? And if I do, then I use them. And if I don't, then I don't. That's it. That's how boundaries work. I, I don't know if it was you I was talking to. No, no you're talking to a mean. A mean about this. It's you how... and a mean, both of you drunk. Both of you drunk. It was a good time. I did not feel good this morning for my meeting. <laughs> um, <laughs> I did not. I did not feel good. I have not felt good for a while. Sad I missed this. Oh, tequila it's, it's, head. It was, it was a fun night, but mm. yes. they uh, He and Amin went down a rabbit hole parsing uh, what it is to uh, make boundaries or the mistakes people make when they hear the phrase, I'm going to place a boundary here. Yeah, yeah. Ba it, it, boundaries are important. People should use them. But people need to understand what they are. Boundaries aren't about other people. They're about the individual who's making the boundary. So... When I say this is a boundary of mine or when I declare or when I just know to myself that this is a boundary, it doesn't tell that you, Dan, or you, Chris, or anybody else how you can behave. You can do whatever you want. The boundary simply tells you how I will react to what you do. And so when somebody lays on me their pronouns, they're asking me to use those. I don't have to use them. But they will have a boundary that says if you choose not to do this thing that is so simple, there will be a consequence for that. And that consequence will be a reduction in trust, a slower window for building a relationship, if it's possible at all. People critique me on Twitter all the time because I block people. Not mute, block. Because I have a boundary. If you come onto my timeline and you're uncivil, or you say things I think damaging to other human beings, like things that will really hurt them, then there will be no discussion. There will be no debate. You will be blocked. I can't stop you from coming on my timeline and doing that. Mm, but I can tell you what the result will be. Every time that video I did for the BBC a couple of years ago about white privilege or the other video about being an anti-racist, uh, every time that pops up, a horde of people come to my timeline and start just vitriol. And I think they think they're doing something, but all they're doing is flagging themselves for me to block them because that's my boundary. John, always good talking to you, always good spending time with you. Now people understand why the first 10 minutes of this were a little sluggish. They are <laughs> sopped in tequila, <laughs> and then you switch to rum. It was a bad idea. Good seeing you, always good seeing you. Thank you.